What's going down U.S. history people? Today in this video we're going to take a look at the New England colonies and the middle colonies. No matter which book you're using for a push, this video is going to help you out with all of the important stuff. Let's get started. First important thing to keep in mind is where are these New England colonies? And they're right here and as you can see there's a couple of things that characterize this region. Many of the people who are going to the New England colony are going for religious motives. There's going to be much more of a mix of both male and female settlers. Many people are coming over as families and they are going to form tight-knit communities and they're going to have a mixed economy. And make sure you know about the differences between the New England colonies and those in the Chesapeake region, Virginia and Maryland. The first of the New England colonies to be founded is the Plymouth Colony. And really it's a result of religious conflict in Europe. Recall the Protestant Reformation sparked dramatic changes in Europe and led to a rise of Puritanism. And this happens in England as well. And you get a group of people known as Puritans and their whole idea is they want it to purify the church. They were harassed by the monarchy over in England. Uh, the king felt they were a threat. Many Puritans were arrested. And they had these new ideas such as predestination that God already chose who was saved before even being born. One group of Puritans, the Pilgrims, were much more radical, hardcore. These were separatists who wanted to break away from the Anglican Church. They actually try to get to Virginia, but they get a little lost, like most of the Europeans do, coming over to the New World, and they land over there in the Massachusetts Bay at what becomes known as Plymouth. They're aboard the Mayflower. You can see a replica right there over near Boston. And before they even get to the colony, they sign something called the Mayflower Compact. And this was a agreement establishing a basic government based upon majority rule. It established the basis for self-government, and one of the key figures in the Plymouth Colony is going to be a guy by the name of William Bradford. The colony is going to struggle in the beginning, just like our friends over in Jamestown did, but not as much. The weather is a little bit more favorable. It's not as hot. They don't have the mosquito problem. And they're going to get the help of a local Native American leader by the name of Squanto, who's going to help the colony survive by teaching them how to farm and hunt. And, of course, the famous story, eventually they'll have the first Thanksgiving. So the Pilgrims are the first landing at Plymouth in 1620, but later on you get more Puritans coming over and they're going to establish the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Remember the Puritans want to reform the church, they don't want to break away, they get a charter from the king to establish the Massachusetts Bay Company, and in 1629 a Puritan by the name of John Withrop receives a charter to establish that colony. They're going to land in 1630 in what is today Boston, and the goal of Winthrop and his Puritan followers is to, as he said, establish and to be as a city upon a hill. Winthrop and his followers believed that they had an agreement with God to build this holy society that would serve as a model for the rest of the world. And so they're coming over here with these religious goals, and Winthrop is going to serve as their first governor. Religion is extremely important in the New England colonies. In fact, education was required. They established Harvard University to train Puritan ministers, but important to note, religious freedom was reserved only for Puritans. Church membership was a requirement for participation in politics. In fact, in all the New England towns, you had not only schools, but also the church and the town hall meeting. The town hall meeting becomes an important part of direct democracy in colonial America, in especially the New England colonies, all church-going males could participate in this form of direct democracy. And in the New England colonies, we have a mixed economy of both agriculture and commerce. The weather was much cooler up there, so they're not going to rely on cash crops like we're going to see in the Chesapeake or the South. Now keep in mind that religious toleration was not something that was practiced in the New England colonies, and people who expressed religious dissent were very often quickly dealt with. One such individual is Roger Williams. He questioned the Puritan leadership of the colony. He questioned the leaders and the doctrine. And he called for the complete separation of church and state. And he also criticized the colony's treatment of Native Americans. He felt the colonies should pay the natives for their land. What a crazy idea. And because of his questioning of the colony, he is banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He's kicked out and he goes off to form his own colony known as Providence, Rhode Island. This is going to be a really important colony. You can see it right there on the map because it's the first colony with complete 
religious freedom. Another individual you should know about is Anne Hutchinson. She does something worse than Roger Williams. She's a woman and she speaks out. She challenged the accepted role of women within the church by openly speaking out against church leaders. And just like Roger, she is also kicked out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Make sure you know about the relationship between the colonists and Native Americans as the New England colonies grow. You're going to see all the different ones which will eventually form. They're inevitably going to come into contact with Native people. There is a massacre that takes place in the 1630s called the Pequa War where the New England colonists nearly wipe out the Pequa tribe. And you can see in that illustration them attacking a Pequa village. One of the things the colonists do is they form something called the New England Confederation in 1643. And this is a military alliance of all the New England colonies except Rhode Island. And it's intended to defend the New England colonies against potential threats. And the threats were many. We got not only Native American threats, but you have the presence of the Dutch a little bit further south and also the French out in the west. England's in a civil war, there's all sorts of problems in England, so the colonies are kind of left to fend for themselves. And so the New England Confederation is an example of colonial unity having a common purpose, which is the defense of the colonies. A really important war you should know about is King Philip's War or Metacom's War. Metacom was his Native American name. Metacom was the leader of the Wampanoag tribe, and he starts organizing a resistance, an alliance of native tribes to try to remove the Puritan settlements from his territory. This time, unlike during the Pequa War, King Philip or Metacom has weapons. You could see that in the image. They're armed. They have these deadly guns so they could fight back and have a shot. But unfortunately for King Philip, he's eventually killed and the resistance is crushed. Significant about King Philip's War, it is the last of the major Native American resistance to the New England colonies. And not only is it the increasing population of the colonies, but diseases are causing cultural and demographic changes for the Native people in the New England region. Moving out of the New England colonies, make sure you know about the middle colonies, and we really call these the breadbasket colonies because they're going to produce a lot of the food for the colonists. The first one is actually inhabited by the Dutch and before it becomes New York it was originally a Dutch colony called New Amsterdam. You could see there in the purple some of the territory Holland controlled and what their colony looked like. Unfortunately for the Dutch they did not have a firm grasp on their colony and Charles II sends a military expedition and grants the area to his brother James the Duke of York. The territory of New Amsterdam is going to become New York and it's going to remain a very religious and ethnically diverse colony. Another important colony is Pennsylvania founded in 1681 by William Penn as a refuge for Quakers. He wanted to create a holy experiment. The group Quakers was actually known as the Religious Society of Friends. Quakers was their nickname. They're pacifists. They were treated very poorly in England. And so William Penn wants to establish this colony and the crown grants him a block of land. This is a proprietorship. Penn creates a very liberal colony. There is representative assembly. People are voting for representation. He seeks to treat the Native Americans very fairly by buying land from them rather than just taking it. There is widespread religious toleration and freedom in Pennsylvania and certain rights are extended to women as well. They have a right to be active in the church and to even be preachers, things that did not happen in the New England colonies. Some key things about the middle colonies to keep in mind is they are going to be demographically, religiously, and ethnically diverse. So you've got a mix of people in this area, whether it be the Dutch, the Quakers, Protestants, Puritans, and so on, and their economics are, like I said, bread basket. They're going to be producing food, especially wheat and corn, but they're also going to be involved in trade and other things. Now that we've broken down all the different regions of the colonies, make sure you understand some colonial policy. Remember the colonies are there because of this economic theory known as mercantilism. The colonies exist to enrich the mother country, in this case England. However, in this early period, you have this thing called solitary neglect. England was involved in its own internal conflicts, such as the English Civil War, and so they're going to be largely indifferent to the colonies. They're going to kind of be letting them do their own thing for a big chunk of this time. There are some exceptions, though. We have some policies that are put in place, some mercantile laws, such as the Navigation Acts, and this is really England trying to keep watch over its colonies. 
The Navigation Acts did things like 1. Trade must be carried only in English or colonial ships. 2. Trade had to pass through English ports before it can move on to other places such as France. And 3. Certain enumerated goods, certain goods that are spelled out from the colonies could be exported only to England. And it starts off with tobacco, but other goods are only allowed to be traded with England. There is very loose enforcement in the beginning. In fact, smuggling was a major problem. The colonists were very often trading with the French and the Dutch and others, but later on the English are going to try to deal with that problem. Stay tuned. There are going to be instances where England's going to try to clamp down on the colonies. You can see that whole region in the green is going to be something called the Dominion of New England in 1686. This is implemented by England to increase royal control over the colonies. And the king sends over an individual by the name of Sir Edmund Andros to regulate and keep these colonies in check. And he does a couple of things most of which are very unpopular, such as enforcing the Navigation Acts, which the colonies were largely ignoring, limiting the town hall meetings, and other things. And it's important to note the goals and interests of European leaders in England, for example, very often at times diverge from those of the colonists, and this led to mistrust on both sides of the Atlantic. This Dominion of New England will eventually end with the Glorious Revolution in 1688, which we'll take a look at next time. And until next time, I hope you learned a whole bunch of stuff. And if you did, click like on the video. Tell your friends about Joe's Productions. Subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions or comments, post them in the comments section. Have a beautiful day. Peace.